our time together with three quotes. The first from Hebrews 11 and the 34th verse. Out of weakness, they were made strong. In commenting on this particular verse, here is what man, one man says. This is the second quote. Consider this verse in relation to the Christian faith. God is looking for a vessel that is weak enough for him to use. It's like Job 28, where Job talks about the cause of the wind, the cause of the river, and the cause of the lightning. The, co the cause of the wind talks about easiest motion. And the course of the waters talks about easiest coursing, whereas the course of lightning talks about easiest yielding. Now notice, easy motion, easy coursing, and easy yielding. According to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, God says, he has appointed the poor, the rich, the looked down upon in society, that he may shame the affluent, the big ones. And here it is, is the whole thing, that the point at which we fail in our submission to God is to come to this area of weakness where we lose our ego and get only into God. There is no vessel too weak for God to use, but you can simply be too big for God to use. And the last quote, <coughs> the last one very familiar with. It's a parable called Day. There was a man who lived in the 20th century. His house was new. Two cars and a boat raised his garage and car full. Color television gleamed in his den. His family was healthy, and lo, good fortune did smile upon him. As was his custom, when the fish were not biting, when company did not come, when he could get up on time, when there was nothing else to do, he regularly went to church. On these occasions, once every five or six weeks, he spent his time deploring the decaying state of the church. The Sunday school was low in attendance. The choir was scanty, the offering was poor, the preacher was discouraged, and something called church training was about short. They ought, he said, they ought to do better than that. What do they think this thing called church is all about? They ought to do better than that. So many months came and passed. This man's children grew up. He knew that they would not go to church because they down at the church had not interested them in religion. The man's health failed. One day he noticed something strange. They down at the church came by no more. They did not visit him in the hospital. Truly, truly, he got angry. But being a great heart, he decided he would forgive him and go to church once more. But when he came, there was only a foundation where the church building once stood. Where is the church? He cried. Death was the answer. Oh, he mourned. They should not have let him die. End of quote. I don't know what we feel as we sit here. Who should keep the church going? Who should make the church grow? Who should make the church effective? Who is it? Us. And so in the last few weeks, this is what we've been looking at, that to make Hasbro United Baptist Church grow 
we need to reconstruct it. And we don't reconstruct just the structure, but better still, the characters and conduct of the people in the church. And we have so far looked at the problems within the church that stop our growth, namely sin, <coughs> greed, and, thank you, fear. And in the course of the last two weeks, we have looked at the next from within, and we have seen, uh-oh, scorn and the threat also stop us from growing. But there's more to it than that. We also find, as we are looking at today, that there is the aspect of treachery. All these forces come against us that God's house may not go forward. We can give in to them and the work will collapse. Or we can stand firm like Nehemiah and the work will go forward. What will we do? Will we realize our personal weaknesses, give up our egos, and so let God have his way? Will you play down God's position and just go with our reasoning so that we may say things are not going our way and so we don't let the pace of God take its course amongst us? None of us will ever be forced, not even by God, to do what he wants. But God wants the people who like the wind easily take a motion, like the waters easily take the course, like the lightning easily yield. Will we do that? If we would do that, one of the ways in which we do it is to see the tricks of the enemy and contend against those. Nehemiah shows us how he does it. He begins by showing us at least where he stands. Nehemiah knows where he stands. Because notice how frequently he mentions the name of God, the God to whom he cries. So his position is he is God's servant. And he's about God's work. And whatever is going to happen, he just must go on doing God's work. And that work, he knows, is constructing, reconstructing, and keeping on constructing Jerusalem. And he knows the enemy is going to pound Jerusalem unless the wall stands. And so he keeps on building the wall. He is God's servant. So, when the enemy invites him to some activity that will distract him from building, he says, I am not your servant. I am God's servant. Own with your business, and I'll be on with my business. And so he says, I am doing a great work. I cannot stop and come to you. Because the moment I give you attention, this work will stop, God's work will stop, God's work will suffer, suffer. God's, God's name will be dishonored. No, I who am God's servant will keep on doing God's work. And the work of God that is required for you and me is abundant, that we might speak the name of our God. And the question we ask ourselves is, how active are we in this God's work. And what you should stop and think about is, what is it that stops you from doing God's work? And this leads us into the next thought. Suspect anything that is going to distract you, distract you from doing God's work. Distractors and distractions are there. They are real. Distractors and distractions are abundant. Distractors and distractions intend just to do that to take your attention away from God's work. <coughs> and what is God's work? That you be a witness, a witness for God. The person through whom, if people don't read the Bible, 
your life and your words will be the Bible that they ever read. You will be the one with whom God incarnates, shows himself alive to the others. And the question is, how effective have you been in doing that? Nehemiah's people are tempted in four ways. First of all, the enemy pretends to be part of them. Then the enemy bluffs them. Then the enemy uses treachery. Then the enemy uses compromise. And all of these are areas in which we ourselves may be tempted. But the question is, do we suspect anything that draws our attention away from God's house? Or would we simply say, well, we're just human living in this world, and let's go on and do it. Let me reiterate some words that I've said to you in time past. And it is this. The moment we say we are not perfect, most of us are saying what is common, even among us, I am not a saint. Did you know that saying that is an insult to God? I'm not a saint. Because what we are saying by saying that is that let's excuse sin, the sin which is the first problem we looked at. Let's excuse fear, the fear which we looked at. Let's excuse greed, which you looked at. Let's excuse scorn, which we looked at. Let's excuse force, which we looked at. And now we're looking at treasure. Let's excuse it. That's what we are saying. But God is saying, no, we can't excuse anything. Because if God says you are a saint, and that's what the Bible abundantly says, then we are saints. Because to be a saint is to be a forgiven sinner. So when I say I'm a Christian, I'm saying I am a saint. I'm a forgiven sinner. Somebody who is living a life clearly set apart to live with which to honor God with all my doings and all my sayings. Who can be a Christian and doesn't make that solemn promise to God? Because then we are playing games if we don't do that. And so, if we say we are not saints, we are saying, God, you are a liar. God, you can't make us live above sin. God, you can't make us live above our enemies. God, you can't make us live above those things that threaten our lives. But we know there have been numerous people that have succeeded. And when we started by giving you that quote from the uh, some man that was going to be Hebrews 11, he talks about Abraham, he talks about Gideon, he talks about David. All these people had points of weakness. When they came to the end of themselves, Ab Abraham became Abraham, as John told us the story, the conversion part. The person who was weak and did not obey God became Abraham, who was full of the air and power of God, and began to do God's work. So from Abraham to Abraham, ha, ha, God's, work, God's power, God's work, ha. And I went on from Jacob, the treachery and bad figure, to each Israel, this person that submits and yields to the will of God. From Gideon, the fearsome character, to this powerful warrior. From little David, the, the holder of a little slave sling and five smooth stones for that one to killing this giant. This is what people of God should begin to see when God says he is our God, he is our power. <laughs> what excuses do we use to stop ourselves from telling others about Jesus? They are my relatives, they are difficult. They are my friends, they know me too well. They are people, they don't listen to me. Oh, what, why do we keep on doing that? When God is saying abundantly, keep away your excuses and lean on God. Moses said, I don't have a mouth, I don't do this. God says, you are going. What's that in your hand? A rod. So what you have is what you use. So what you have, you have a mouth. What you have, you have a body. What you have, you have a voice. What you have, you have behavior. What you have, use what you have. God is going to use that. But are we yielding? Are we cursing? Are we motioning? Are we trading? Are we... Anything that keeps you away from God, suspect that. You know, we've used enough excuses. Uh, today, for this reason, I'm not coming to church. Why don't we use now church as the reason we don't go to the other places? I'm not coming there because I'm going to church. I'm not coming there because I'm going to worship. I'm not because I'm going... You know, in the three years, almost three years, not yet three years, that I've been here, there are a good number of us who have not even so much as have been to a prayer meeting. Wednesday we have our prayer meeting. Uh, Wednesday we have our Bible study. To some of us, others can do that, not me. I have other things to do. How I wish each one of us 
who deliberately make it in their calendar. Prayer meeting Wednesday. What? God says to pray. God says, I do it in my house. We can all do it in our houses. Then who will be here? You know, you know our recent, one of our recent prayer meetings, here's what one of us prayed. God, help me never to end another week before I commend Jesus seriously to you. You didn't hear that because you are not there. Here's what somebody else said in a Bible study. Now, how can I seriously follow God? These things that we're looking at are difficult. How can I seriously follow God? And how can I overcome my weakness? How can I be sure I belong to God and I can do for God? And it was discussed. I don't know what your answer is. But if we had been together there and studied together, see, we would have one voice, one behavior, one testimony, and see to speak to the whole world. But each one of us goes with our own business, because we do our own business. It's not different settings. Is that the way God's people? See how often and how frequently the Bible mentions that Nehemiah and Tim worked together. You know, some of us find excuses. There's something that we don't like about, you know, this ministry or that ministry. Why don't we come in and bring in what we would like, what we want to be to that ministry? I don't know anybody who runs a ministry in this church who says, I don't want anybody to advise me. I don't want anybody to tell me, to tell me how best to improve on this. I know what to do, and I just tell everybody what to be done. Not even me. I must listen to you. We listen to each other. That's how our iron sharpens iron. And so look at what ministry you've never been a part of and, 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 and say, God, help me be a participant. This is how we testify. As the parable we looked at says, this man who goes to church once every five weeks just to see how bad the state, how the state is. Some of, how many of us have been that? Anybody can go to church at any time. But it is a concept of seeing. This is your life. It's not just another deed. It's, it's, church is life. It's the, the involvement of the whole vessel. That's what testifying is. And having said that, we come to our third point, which is this. Stay away from anything that distracts you from God. Notice how many times the text says, over and over again they came and said, do this, over and over again. Temptations to stay away from the work of God will never stop. They will keep on coming. Some of us will cry on how, how much we've been persecuted. Others of us cry of how little attention is given to us. There's still others begin to say, you see, nobody in the society in which we are behaves like ourselves. This is what it is. And we succumb to all this. Just on Saturday, as I was moving around visiting some of our people, I noticed a girl that used to come to our youth group. The last time I asked the friends, why is this friend of yours not coming? They said, oh, she's not found a boyfriend. <laughs> and I did see, actually, this young girl was walking. And the, you know, I was driving, and the girl, I waved at her, and she waved back. And they were arm in arm, not in arm in arm, they actually embraced each other when they were walking. And as I was driving past the, 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 the through town, they were still moving together, embracing each other. Surely that was better than being in a youth group, My prayer was, God, that girl, the little bit that she has had, let it weave through her frame and show her the present entertainment may make her for a season happy, but it won't take her beyond this earth. But this is exactly what's happening all around us. We make people believe, enjoy yourself now. I said so much about last week, I'm not going to much detail. But this is what our children feel like. Whatever thrills them. If I should say tonight, let's have a service at seven, and one of the best singers is going to perform at the hall. We'll be saying, Pastor, let's postpone the service. Because we want to go to the hall. And it's, that's a human speaking. If there is hockey taking place at 11 a.m., how many of us say, no, I'm going to worship, I might be hockey game. And that's why in some instances, people say, since the hockey game is at 11, let's cancel the service so that people may watch the hockey game and then have the service at 3 p.m. You see, we've come to the point where we can compromise who we are because of what's going on around us. And in certain instances, it must be done because the idea is you must move people in 
But in the deeper sense of the word, those of us who say we call, um, call ourselves people of God shouldn't be the ones who will be saying, let's rise above this world. Let's rise above the entertainment of this world. Let's rise above it all and show that even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. The sparkle that John was talking about begins to take its weave and sway into us at the time of conversion and doesn't stop until Christ takes us home. He keeps us taking there, getting there, keeps us taking there. And one of our studies again, we're talking about some men who have influenced our lives in our commitment to God. Somebody quoted one about whom they said, oh, the moment I listen to him, yeah, he just excites me about the things of God. But yet, when I measure up what he says to what I learn at my church, I realize that little stuff is milk. I want the meat that I get at my station. How many of us can say that because of our commitment to God? But we, I don't know. All I'm saying, therefore, is this. Anything that stops my growth, anything that impedes my growth, anything that retards my growth, everything that, that stagnates my growth, lay it aside. Come to God. And here's my final thought. Don't have any confidence in yourself. Ah, isn't that what we are told in our world? Assert, ascertain yourself. Be self-assertive. Well, that's when Nehemiah began when he says, I'm a servant of God. But the way we ascertain ourselves as people of God is not in ourselves. It's in the one in whom we trust. God is our strength. So notice how Nehemiah just ejaculates prayer. You see, look at Tobiah. Remember me, O oh God. What? This is very natural. He doesn't have to struggle. He's just pouring himself out. Those of us who struggle in doing that, you see, because we want to be very formal and it's, it's, it's calculated so that we impress God, God is not looking at impressing him. He's looking at the attitude of our heart. How serious are we? Only the day before yesterday, somebody says to me, you know what? Some people say, give us a film on Sunday evening and give us a film one morning instead of your preaching. Just give us somebody. <laughs> It all sounds very entertaining. This is way better than a film. <laughs> Thanks, John. You see, what we come to be is fellowship with each other. The film is not fellowship. Mm-hmm. Or any, any, you know, we, we could play music here and just entertain ourselves instead of singing. But the idea was we are singing this one. You came alive and it was good. John just, you maybe John should ask more of us to come alive. Mm-hmm. See, it's, it's a good thing to come alive and it's that liveliness in each one of us, that puts a spark in each one of us, so that as we go out, we're all sparkling. What's happening with these guys? They've just been together, worshipping their God. Amen. So when we study the word together, when we pray together, and the Holy Spirit helps us, we get revived, and the whole world sees we are not the same as the world. Are we going to go that way? Or we say, God, we don't want the way of the wind. We don't want the way, the way of the waters. We don't even want the wind of lightning. We want it our way. If we are God's people, we want it God's way. Where are we? Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful that your interest is in us. And your interest is in us, that we may be such servants of yours, as turn out to be a people through whom you are understood to be God and Savior. And so we pray you will overrule our discrepancies and mistakes and make us rise to the point to which we overcome hurdles of reconstructing this church from within us and head us of this God, reconstructing this church from without us. So that with you helping us, we may abide in your word and in prayer so experience you and sense your power alive and work amongst us that no falsehood stand us, but you, God, will betray forth your prince among us as the God of his saints. And so to you we cry, even as our Savior taught us. 